I'm here with the writer, director, co-producer, and music supervisor, Jacqueline Lansou, uh, for Moon 66 Questions. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. Thank you for joining us to the audience. Thank you. So what does close to you mean? Does that make sense? That's a well, line from the film, of course. Uh, yes, it's a line of the film, and it's the first question that we ever uh, listen to in the duration of the film. In a way, it's, a, it's an opening question. It sets um, the tone. It sets the actual um, subject of the film, because this is what um, the protagonist is tortured by, in a way, trying to understand um, what intimacy means, what in, how intimacy feels, and indeed what, in, what, what, does it, what, does, what parenting means in the sense that, you know, does it mean the fact that someone brought you here that he's supposed to be someone close to you or it just, you know, somehow society imposing stuff on you? So it's a very big question. To me, uh, what's close to me, I think um, it's only myself, to be honest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the only person I feel close to, honestly, it's myself. So yes, sorry, but this is a fact. <laughs> you, um, I'm struck that also that the first moment of intimacy is with a stranger, um, because so often I think in life we find that we open up in ways to strangers that we don't open up to the people we feel closest to. This is totally my case. Uh, like I have, I have opened up to the girl at the supermarket. I have cried at the taxi driver. Uh, and it's very funny because in a way you open up, although you have a real person in front of you, but because you don't know them, you think they're going to vanish and they don't really exist. It's like talking to a spirit or talking to a ghost. Uh, so indeed, uh, yes, it is a fact, I have to say. I'm always fascinated by the choices filmmakers make for their, the names of their characters. So I wanted you to say something about Artemis and Paris. Yes, um, I never research a lot thoroughly because I, I don't like when names have a very, very deep meaning. I just like names, the sound of the names mostly. So I just like the sound of the names. Many people have thought that somehow I wanted to associate the characters with Greek mythology. Uh, no, nothing like that in my head. So I just like the, I, I really like the names. I think it's funny, though, because the dream that she describes, which is so rich and, and it's so imaginative, she becomes a deer. So you're kind of inviting the audience to speculate that there is some connection to the myth, of course, since Artemis was a hunter of deer. Yes, what is very crazy is that I didn't know about the myth until after I had shot the film. And How could somebody I, from I Greece not know that myth? myth. I, have, I have an affinity with deer as an animal. I love it. And... Uh, you know, it's somehow universe interconnected stuff. I don't know. That's funny. That's yes. really funny. <laughs> Nonetheless, I mean, there is a prevalence in the film of, of images of um, <clears throat> games of fate or uh, speculations that tarot cards, horoscopes, right? Dream interpretations. Um, and it's hard not to think about it in light of Greek mythology or not in light of Greek, um, the house of Atreus, for example, the cursed house of Atreus. Um, even the shot of the, the physiotherapy from above looks like a seance, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So you do use, of course, tarot cards as a structuring device. So maybe talk about that conceit, the, 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 the interweaving of, um, the reality is she's facing and the the wondering she's doing and in, in relation to these kinds of wish for predictions in life. Yes. Um, what I have um, somehow felt and have observed is that people go to crazy extents to get answers when life itself cannot provide them. Uh, and this is, I think, is where astrology, tarot cards, and all these speculation methods, uh, as you mentioned, fit. So in a way, I wanted mostly to create an environment for my protagonist to exist, not really consciously show that she's, you know, indeed 
on her own, asking stuff and getting the answers she wants from other mediums. I wanted to, to mix and merge the reality she's, she's, the suffering reality she has to go through and have a parallel, like an aura environment around the reality that somehow in my head underlines her angst, but at the same time minimizes her angst because it's very small in terms of the whole world. Uh, it's very weird because when I think about it, it's very clear to my head, but I can never really explain what I mean. <laughs> I mean, I mean, but now let's say we discuss, okay, you're in Brooklyn, I'm in Athens, and this is our current reality at the same time though. And this is why I love filmmaking because you can see other realities and other, you know, sh at the same time here, other things may happen to that we cannot really, really feel them or understand them. So this is how, what I try to do in the film to, yes, the tracks for like four months, put the tarot cards and have all the sky and star stuff going on to create an environment for her to somehow exist and solve. And it relates, of course, to the games that she herself plays and the imaginative play she she can she engages in the game of charades, obviously the game the the kind of the monologue about the prostheses and even what I'm struck by in the game of charades that these games that she plays suddenly become very, very real, like when she says, "Choke me, it's shocking almost right yes, uh, yes. Yes, I agree and thank you. And this was my exact, exact uh, guidance to my actor, Sofia Kokali, and to all the crew. It's weird because, you know, I don't like films that show things like one. I, I, I find films that try to simulate, like, to simulate life more real in a way. So this is exactly what happens. She starts to play, but because of all the emotional impact and what she's going through, the play in, it's so thin to become something dangerous for the, the others, for herself, very sad, something that is funny. A few minutes later, it's tragic. And it's, you know, all this balance and imbalance in itself. So for sure, um, and it's funny because this was just one take. Mm. Uh, mentioned it was just one take. And before they started, I told Sofia, uh, have Zulavski in mind. And she was like, what? And this is how I left her. And this is how I left her because it was really in Zulavski's possession that, that my first time as a viewer, I saw this um, from normal to totally crazy. And then questioning what is normal, what is crazy. This is also something very important for me as a filmmaker to discuss all the borderline things of what is madness, what is sickness, what is health, what are all of these words, you know? So for sure, um, exactly. It's very nice that you put it like that. It's but I'm also always struck, you know, having two young children of my own that when you watch them engaging in play and then there's always one kid who takes it one step too far yeah, and yeah. suddenly it's not fun anymore and, you know, somebody is really injured. And so it's just, it, it really mirrors life. I mean, that's one of the lessons we learned very early age, right? Yes. The very fine line, as you said. Yes. Um, talk a little bit about your work with the two main actors. I mean, obviously you've been reunited with, uh, with Sofia Kukal, who's been in your short film and, and how you work with her and Lazarus. Yes. Um, so Sofia, we have worked in the short that was in MoMA in 2017. And then before shooting the feature, uh, in July, August 2019, I shot another another short in June 2019. <laughs> so we, we didn't really reconnect. Uh, we were always connected in a way. And, uh, you know, a, a very, very rich friendship has formed. Uh, so therefore it was very easy to work with her in the sense that she knew somehow the story that I was working on the past years. And uh, what was very interesting for me was uh, that we have a very strong, um, mental and spiritual connection. So it's logical and emotional. It is uh, funny and it is not funny, you know what I mean? So it's a, he's, he's an amazing collaborator. And we mostly worked uh, through writing stuff. Uh, I don't rehearse. I don't like rehearsing. I find it, uh, at least up until now, okay? I find it a bit uh, forced. So I was exchanging um, letters 
and the supposed diary pages of uh, the protagonist's diary, let's say, in order to get her into the whole thing. This is what I did with Sophia. And uh, with Lazarus, it was very hard for me um, to approach the actor and the character. Um, we worked through, I don't know if you know this book, I guess you know it, uh, Roland Barthes' uh, A Lover's Discourse. Sure. Okay. That was, that was a question I was going to ask you, is why Barthes is in the credits. Oh, I, yeah. I put I know, okay, okay, good. <laughs> yes, because, uh, you know, this book, uh, when I uh, when I came across this that book in the past, I really felt that uh, it greatly uh, in full detail explains the paradox of falling in love and not, not always getting back love from the one that you want. So his psychology in my head was the fact that he was gay. He, he could never, ever, ever openly accept that made it whatever. Therefore, his own health system attacked him because this is something I really believe in a way that mind and body is one. And uh, so we worked with the book a lot. And for his physical performance, you know, it was very hard and challenging uh, because uh, multiple sclerosis is not a standard standardized disease in the sense that you can walk like that, you can walk like this, you can do this, you can do that, you can have multiple sclerosis. It's not very particular. So mm -hmm. this was so this was rather uh, challenging, and um, I didn't know how to deal it, and I didn't want it to be bad. So I was very lucky to find an amazing, amazing uh, woman. Her name is Vicky Panayotaki, and she's uh, it's a particular technique called Alexander technique, mm -hmm. where somehow they managed to to control a particular group of muscles and others not to control and have spasticity, but not have something very, very, very weird, but amazing. So the so in a way, Lazarus became really sick for the duration of the, the shoot. I mean, after we, we stopped shooting, during break, he indeed was not okay uh, because he was so much into this thing and it was uh, great, he was great. I think he's great in the film. I mean, he is great and he's completely convincing, of course. I mean, I, I, you know, it's it's striking to know that it's a physical, a form of physical therapy because of course it could also be an acting technique. I mean, mm -hmm. you can just, we describe it the Alexander technique as if it's some sort of way of getting in touch with your, your, your physical performance, the way you yeah. inhabit space. And so much of the film is about the way people inhabit spaces, the way they fill spaces, the way that they're shrunken in his case right he's become completely immobilized in space exactly um and how about their work with each other yes i really wanted to depict the gap and the distance uh, so they hadn't met before the actual shoot which was uh, very funny it was very funny because uh, the first day sofia did not really like lazarus <laughs> Perfect. Like she, she, yes, and she was like, you know, I don't think his smell is okay. So she, she was saying something super random stuff, and I was like, yes, this is very good. And I'm like, this is your father <laughs> for the following few weeks. You have to deal with him. So it was very interesting. But and she what didn't even know the character he was going to be playing. She didn't even know the. She hadn't read the whole script, or she had. She had read the script, but she didn't know who who was the actor. Wow. So they hadn't met. Wow. And it was, yes, it was great for me. Uh, what was greater, and I'm not joking at all, is the fact that at the end, they really loved each other, <laughs> like in the film. And I was like, what's going on? And uh, in our rap party, they were hugging and stuff, and it was uh, two months love. And Sophia told him, you know, initially didn't like you. And Lazarus said, yes, I understood that, but it's okay. <laughs> so it was <laughs> a very real film real film in all dimensions. Of yeah, it's, it's, it's brilliant. Uh, the only way it would have been better is if she thought he really was, uh, had multiple sclerosis. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one thing that I find really touching is the, 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 they are connected even from the very start because what they are connected by is two forms of communication that also happen to be forms of artistic creativity the writing of diaries and the making of home movies. And so there is, it's just a vicarious way of corresponding. It's the way that people correspond when they can't 
really say it to someone's face, right? Or even, of course, the letter at the end. So, you know, I love the idea of that kind of, it's so frightening to communicate with somebody that you are scared of and love, or maybe don't even love. So you do it in a different way. And I wondered if you, the, the idea of you interweaving the diary and the home movie is something that uh, was, was clear to you from the very start and something that really kind of reinforced the, the question of communication. This, uh, this particular idea uh, was the first idea about the yeah. film. Uh, like I didn't know how the film would start, would end. I, I didn't know scenes, but I knew that this would be a pivotal key idea and, and structural um, tool in a way. But it's amazing your observation. Uh, it's the first time someone says this, and uh, it's like you jumped in my head. It was, it was the first thing because what was also interesting for me was the fact that this guy never used words. So even in his own home videos, you don't hear anything and you don't even see anything. It's empty spaces, mostly and silent, fixed stuff, like the guy behind the camera. And then you hear the guy's, the guy's daughter's voice with words and with blah, 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 blah. So um, I'm very happy that you, you, that you read through it and you enjoyed it. Um, I have been fighting with my producers about it. No one liked it. No one liked even the VHS uh, shoot. Uh, but it's it's my favorite part of the film. So thank it's you. Fascinating because it take you know it, one of the things I love about your films in general is that you don't obviously reveal everything and hold everyone's hand along the way, um, which is kind of the point of the movie. Um, but talk also about the last shot of the film because it, I find it really ambiguous and really interesting the, the whole movie at the very end where with a with a baby daughter yeah in what sense ambiguous what do you mean because it's an odd first of all it's an odd thing to do right you go into some a child's room and you videotape them then you continue to videotape them by putting the video camera on the chair instead of just turning it off which seems like a normal thing to do. So you, and then you have him looming over her. So you have no idea where this is heading. Okay. Uh, I mean, maybe it's, maybe I've seen too many uh, um, uh, TV movies in my life, <laughs> but it just, you know, it looks like a very ambiguous image of a father looming over a daughter who's asleep and innocent. And there's, and then of course it becomes something very loving and protective, although also ends up very ambiguously, right? what will happen next, right? You yes. know, who knows? And with the empty wall. Right. Actually the very end frame of the film, apart from the small moon, it's an empty wall. It's again, emptiness, it's again, the gap. It's again, a no space, a space in no space, you know? So sure. Uh, what I want to do with the last image was uh, if ever someone wondered if that guy ever shot his own daughter, is that I gave it to them, you know? It's the idea that, he was shooting stuff, stuff, but one time, indeed, one of the things he decided to capture was his own daughter. So it was, in a way, his sign of, let's say, care, love in the past, in case she doubted that it ever existed, in a way. So but he chooses the, to include himself in the image as well. Of course. Like, a, it's a father and daughter, let's say. Well, it's interesting. It's interesting. Uh, I mean, I, so... You find it interesting, uh, because... In many, many, many tapes uh, of my family, they do it. So maybe really? I, have, I have to revisit um, their practice. It's possible. I mean, uh, you know, we'll talk about this another time. We can psychoanalyze the one home movie that exists of me, uh, which is kind of an amazing one. But but it's also just, I guess, now that we make home movies not with cameras, but with phones, it's not as intuitive that you would set it down somewhere and keep the action going while you get into the frame. Right, yes. like sure. when you're doing something to, to wake your child up or something like that, it's not really something you'd be apt to do is take this and then just like find a way of setting it up, right? Yes. Sure. But it is, I still think it's interesting that your family keeps themselves in the image and puts the camera down and keeps filming. It's kind of a... In the past, in the past. Yeah, yeah. So, I, think, I think it has some um, narcissism inside it. Huh. 
in the sense that now, and it's nice that you made me think of this because uh, one of the character traits of uh, the father in the film is that he has been a huge narcissist in the backstory. So I think uh, maybe partially he did that at the end huh. because of this very thing. I don't know. Huh. The other, I mean, the other recurring theme, one of the things I think that's wonderful in it is the way you, the, the humor, of course, that's infused in the film, but the way you mark time, the sense of time and losing time and the sense of what's lost and what's gained and that the discrepancy between the time that's on the image, the, the time code and the diary entries. Um, but I also love these kind of bizarre factoids that you throw in about Alice in Wonderland and Catcher in the Rye and, and Jenna Rollins. I mean. Uh, you know how this all started? Uh, it's a very personal thing. Uh, when I was a kid, I was very, very sad sometimes. And uh, when I was very sad, I was like, okay, let's see what's happening in the world now. And I would type a date and I would see, you know, war, wars and deaths. And I was like, okay, I'm here, I'm fine. And this is how I, I got up to memor memorizing how I have in my head super trivia information about birthdays, death dates, marriages, <laughs> divorces. And, and it's interesting because after a point, when I was a teenager, I started writing on my wall several dates of things that have happened or will happen. And uh, it, it has also, in a way, became a system in my head. So I put it there because I think that when someone is indeed struggling, they really need to see a bit outside themselves to feel a bit better. So this is what she's doing there in a way. Do you still write on your wall? No, no, uh, no, no, not anymore. Uh, Faulkner wrote the beginning of a novel on his wall. You can still see it when you go to his home in, uh, in um, Oxford, Mississippi. It's very moving. You know, he would lie in bed and write his novel on the wall. I don't have a house of my own now. I'm renting, so that's why I cannot. Write. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I want to thank you so much for, for taking time to have this conversation. And I hope that, you know, very soon you'll have a chance to have it shown on a big screen with an audience, which I'm sure you're feeling very uh, bittersweet about. Uh, yes, yes. Have I, you I had a screen? Have you had a screening on a, in a theater? No. Not yet. Well, it'll happen, I hope, soon enough. I hope so too. But thank, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us. Thank you for the amazing questions and insights. Thank you. <laughs>